In this final lecture, I propose to talk really about mainly about one topic, which is the architectural energetics of building blocks, and then to have some some sort of uh, thrash about their dating and some final thoughts on their conservation for posterity, concluding with a brief summary uh, of the ground we've covered. <clears throat> Brock Energetics, a guy called E.M. Abrams, an American archaeologist, was effectively the first one, I think, to consider the architectural energetics <coughs> of archaeological monuments. He measured how much energy it took to build Mayan structures. His approach was based on an understanding of the buildings, and he had the enormous advantage that they're still building huts uh, in the region in exactly the same way as they were built, even in pre-Mayan times. The most modest form is this simple uh, residence, um, and was the most persistent form with only minor variations from about 1100 BC to now. Abrams, with this wealth of material and with access to vernacular practices in this building, which are going on at the moment, was able to undertake a kind of a QS, bill of quantities approach uh, to working uh, on these structures. Um, and he reduced everything um, that was done and that was acquired um, to the per person, no, to the person days costs for the production, transport, construction, and in some cases, reconstruction of the monuments. Thus, for example, quarried stone was costed on the basis of the labor cost of its quarrying in person days. And similarly, the shaping and transporting of it to site was expressed in person days of effort, not in its current commodity value. To the, his advantage, of course, he had that stuff available to him, uh, still being worked on in his you know, contemporary landscape. We don't have the privilege of contemporary Brock building or chambered cairn building, except for activities in a small quarry in uh, Spittle. And so I have to find, I have had to find an alternative cost base, and I've done that by using, by calculating the amount of energy as a physical parameter. It takes a certain amount of energy to lift a kilogram weight, and that's measurable, okay? And it takes a certain amount of energy to move that kilogram weight, to displace it by a measured distance. And again, that's all calculable. And applying these fairly simple physical formulae, physics formulae, I suppose, really, uh, to the problem. I converted all of the activities involved in quarrying, transporting, and building blocks into kilowatt hours uh, as a common ba uh, basis of cost. It sounds great. It's as weak as water, and I'll tell you why. The assumption is vitiated to some extent, but I'll also try to tell you um, <coughs> Uh, why it still has value. The canonical form of the, of the brock is a cylinder with a truncated cone, within a truncated cone. These are forms that can be easily defined by equation. And what I've done is to reduce the equations to just two parameters, the internal radius and the angular slope of the outer wall, its deviation from the vertical. And from those two parameters, we can calculate the volumes of all of the monuments. I have used the intersection of the two walls as the point at which I stop calculating the volumes. Um, the outer wall inclines, and the gallery corbels in, and when the two walls meet, they're almost the same thickness. And I stop there because I don't know what the configuration of the top was. So there's a color of material which I've discounted. As well as that, there are holes through the walls, the main entrance and cell entrance, entrances and all the rest of it. And I haven't put them in because they're too variable. Um, there isn't an average uh, figure that I can put in for that. Uh, so I've discounted those two. But um, for individual monuments where you have that data, you can just run it through again. And, uh, and get specific numbers for, for them. Now, applying the formulae for the volumes of hard rock and sedimentary rock blocks, uh, 
That's the direct calculation from the model. That is a direct calculation from the model with an answer in cubic meters. Um, and from those volumes, the mass of the walls can then be calculated using the standard bulk density figure for masonry um, to convert the numbers to... There's the formula. They're, they're exciting, aren't they? Um, there's a more tedious version of them. This would be available to you, I guess, so if you're really interested in them, you can go back and look at them. Um, there's nothing exciting there. Now, these are the masses, the weights of the brocks in tons, and there's a difference, obviously, between um, the sedimentary stone. The biggest one up there is 13,000, down here is 16, over 16,500, so it's 17,000 uh, tons of stone. Um, we're not interested in those numbers. I just want you to follow the logic of what I've done to see where I'm going. Now, to facilitate inter-site comparisons, you know, if, the, if we can't arrive at, if we cannot easily arrive at reliable figures for any one brock without treating all of them individually, and I'm too old for that, um, what I've done is to focus on their intercomparability. And in doing that, I have rigged the data so that all of the estimates are minima, okay? So all of the real numbers are bigger, and in some instances, and the, the amount by which they're bigger increases from that corner to that corner. So I've artificially suppressed them for the sake of keeping them intercomparable. The assumptions made are that the brocks are canonical, that the quarry was 100 meters from the building site, and that the ground between the quarry and the site was level, that all of the energy was supplied by human labor, that stones were handled only once in each step in the chain operatoire, that humans are 100% efficient, I particularly enjoy that one, <laughs> that one, <laughs> having worked on building sites for a lifetime, um, it, well, archeology span sites, which is kind of anti-building sites, um, I, I had some chuckles at that, um, I've also assumed that one or predominantly one rock type is used in each brock and that the calculated average density values for the hard and sedimentary rock types are representative. We did actually measure these in the field. We're not looking at tabulated values. Um, but nonetheless, the value is an average for all the stones that go in the brock because you have denser bands of stone and less dense bands of stone. And they do make significant differences. The cumulative effect of all these assumptions mean, as I've said, the calculated vol volumes are minima, but the trade-off for the imprecision is that the relative differences between brocks can be relied on as a general indication, and that's all I want from this exercise. So here they are as masses. And the significance of mass is ground loading. You've seen that we've said earlier that, for, that the ground loading ranges from about three elephants per square meter to 10 elephants per square meter um, up and down these, uh, these tables in our elephant equivalent scale. In general, form formal foundations were not employed in building rocks, although gullies were infilled and not infrequently, a basal layer of slabs was set out projecting up to 250 millimetres outside the lowest course of building stone. Steve Doctrell has suggested that this plinth course was used to spread the load of the wall, but the mass of the wall is simply too large for such a thin layer of slabs. And in fact, you know, what is that thin layer of slabs except another course in the wall? So it's contributing to the process problems of loading, not spreading it. Um, too, too thin to offer much in the way of resistance. It seems likely to me that the slab layers were used for two purposes, setting out the brock, which was always going to have been a challenge, and levelling the site, because the control of level is pretty critical. The principal lesson we have, oh, and the setting out is critical for its circularity. We need the brocks to be as close to perfectly circular as we can make them. The principal lesson we will learn here is that the inner wall was always close to a critical value. But we have seen from modelled experiments that small-scale subsidence is quickly bridged. And I think I'll just repeat these. You've seen this earlier. 
Uh, now, small-scale subsidence is quickly bridged and the damage is localised even on full-scale models. It requires levels of subsidence that are effectively inconceivable. In this uh, model here, we drop the ground levels here until the, the broke, the bro broke. But to scale, that's about eight meters of subsidence, and you're not going to find that on a site, you know. Uh, you know, or you're certainly not easily going to find that in real world conditions. We've also seen that the movement of the inner wall inwards out of the vertical towards the center of the brock, if the inner wall tilts inwards by as little as one degree, that would detach the inner wall from the outer wall at the uppermost level. And as the inward lean continued, it would peel away. Um, in the background of that is the observation that the floor slabs, like most of the big slabs in the Brock, only have about 100 millimetres of insetting into the masonry that they're in. So they're not effective ties. They do not hold those walls together. In fact, they're struts that keep them apart. But it means that that adds to the fragility of the inner wall. It takes very little deformation of the inner wall uh, to cause great sorrow. And so although we don't uh, envisage huge subsidence being a challenge to Brock's in, in the general way of things, even small subsidence which tilts the wall footing can create critical difficulties. <coughs> now, masonry creep. Masonry creep is not an obnoxious mason, uh, but a process observable within masonry of all types, not just dry stone walling. And We've talked about the work of uh, Bigelli and Ozon <laughs> Nozelli and Bigoni um, about how stresses percolate through uh, Brock's. And I said in the last lecture that you can have that as a critical result of a teetering wall, but you can also have it as a slow process that develops over time. And there are certain unhappinesses in that Brock wall there, as you can see. And that seems to suffer the slower form of uh, masonry creep. Now, let us turn, I, I put that in just as a, an aside almost, uh, in going forward. Um, human beings, regardless of gender, in their adult form, consume a consistent amount of energy each day, or a certain amount of energy each day, which keeps them alive. And that's called their basic metabolic rate. Now, clearly, um, gentlemen of traditional proportions like myself probably consume a little more, but um, of that little more, uh, still um, about 1.743 kilowatts per person per day is the cost of staying alive, is the infrastructural cost of being a human being. And it doesn't differ between men and women, uh, according to Frankenfeld, Rothiosi, and about 25 other authors who published in uh, 2005 on this subject. A very interesting study done at Aberdeen University. That same study also calculated that the amount of energy that people have left over routinely to do stuff, you know, activity, labor available energy, is a miserable 75 watts as our continuous rating which means that we output in work capacity about 0.6 of a kilowatt over an eight hour period. And again, there isn't a lot of variation here. People like uh, Frank Avalone, who bases his measurements on watching or acting as a QS on enormous earth moving projects during the second world war, but also in third world situations where you use, you know, 3,000 people instead of a JCB kind of thing. Uh, he also notes that over an eight hour day for a 48 hour week and on an ongoing basis, um, a 35 year old laborer uh, for total expenditure, uh, energy expenditure, including basal metabolic energy, uh, is, works at 0.49 of a horsepower, which is 366 works, uh, watts. And of that expenditure, approximately 0.1 of a horsepower, or 75 watts, is available for useful work. He suggests that younger people can generate about 15% more. A 20-year-old person can generate about 15% more power, and a 60-year-old man, uh, about 20% less. 
The biophysicists don't agree with him about that variation. They argue that for continuous rating, um, 75 watts is a good measure. It's interesting, nonetheless, that however they disagree on the minutiae, they both conclude that the work energy available from people is about 0.6 of a kilowatt a day. Now, I think I'm going in the wrong direction here. I am indeed. Ignoring um, Crendel's uh, writing is extremely gender biased and he clearly has very little truck with women on cons large construction projects. But if we ignore him here, experimental work has nonetheless found no difference in the work available energy between males and females. So there is a convergence between physiological and field experimental evidence. That suggests we can place some reliance on our 75 watt human who can work for eight hours a day, day after day after day after day, and can sustain that work rate indefinitely. Obviously, we can, um, the processes involved create a zero sum in that if people are forced to work longer hours, they require more energy and either the BMR their basal, uh, basic metabolic rate will be depleted or, and, and they will begin to lose weight, weight and ultimately life. Um, but interestingly, adding more energy in the shape of additional food has some limited effect, but people can still be worked to death on apparently healthy diets. So the limits in terms of energy outputs of the human machine are fairly constricted. Now, brace yourself for a bunch of numbers. They're not going to matter an awful lot. So try to follow the logic rather than track the numbers in these endless blooming tables. Um, right. I've converted the masses of the blocks into the number of kilowatt hours it would take to quarry, transport, and build those masses into a structure, okay? using the assumptions that I've already indicated. If we take 0.6 of a kilowatt hour as an indicative work rate, then we can convert these kilowatt hours, that's for sedimentary blocks, that's for hard rock blocks, um, let's just ignore the difference, um, and we can convert those into calculations of person days. Now remember all the assumptions here, okay? Um, but these are in spite of all the assumptions, these are very unlikely to be out by as much as an order of magnitude. But they're not precise, and I'm not pretending they're precise, but I am saying that they're proportionately correct. If that one is wrong, that one is wrong by a, proportion, by a proportionate amount, okay? Now, To help you get your head around what these vast numbers of person days might boil down to, well, I have arbitrarily said, let's organize these people into work crews. And I have arbitrarily put in work crews of 20, 30, 40 persons up to 100 persons. It's unrealistic. But it'll give you some idea of duration. How many days will it take to build blocks? if you have work crews instead of individuals. And the answers are in that zone. The, the reliable answers, I think, are in that zone. It's, you can probably build a fairly decent brock in 100 to 150 days, is the indication. Hmm? Now, finally, I wanted to show you the cost difference um, in person days between building a hard rock brock and building a sedimentary brock. And as you can see, in the smallest case, in an unbuildably small brock, that would be some number, which I can, <coughs> can I see it here? I can, which is probably 176. Yeah, look at that. And uh, in the biggest case, the difference would be that you would require, whatever it is, almost 7,000 extra person days to complete the job. Right.
Now, on this slide, I've put in the initials of uh, Don Calway, um, Midhow and Gurness is lurking down there somewhere uh, to show you how they sit in terms of the build proportions. You'll remember that these numbers are the angle of slope of the outer wall and these numbers are the radii of the blocks, internal radii. I could have put up all of the other blocks for which we have reasonable data on the, um, on the radii. And you'd see that they're all here. I said earlier that I included all of the um, radial measurements, radius measurements that exist in the literature and all of the exter external batter angles that exist in the literature because I didn't want to uh, constrain the data when I started out. But actually, the occurrence of rocks when you, where you have measurable data suggests that this data range is nonsense. Um, and that really brings me to the point of this exercise, which is that. This is the buildable range of rocks somewhere in there. These ones are too small. They're constrained by scale. You cannot downscale the rock because of the width of the inner wall and the width of the gallery. You can't build up here for two reasons, one of which is engineering, again, that you overload the inner wall when you come up into that corner, but the costs are also becoming staggering. And down here, you have principally an economic constraint because cost increases as we go this way and that way. So, the <coughs> formal constraint of a canonical form, of the canonical form, is further constrained by the practicalities of building, so that not only are the blocks the same shape, by and large, they're the same size. If we take size to mean the effort involved in building, there are very significant apparent differences between the hard rock blocks and the sedimentary blocks. But in reality, in terms of their socioeconomic uh, costs, um, they're very, very similar. Now, I wanted to just make a couple of observations on why uh, the numerical data in the literature is such tosh, and it's not hard to find. Here we have an internal cylinder and an external uh, section, frustum of a cone, okay? And here we have erosion planes. This is what's left of the brock. It's cut on a plane at 5 degrees, whatever the values are there, uh, 15 degrees and 25 degrees. And those are not unusual or unreasonable states in which to find the monuments. I'm going to take a, well, a single example uh, to show you why the dimensions are so crazy. At Altbrach, Roger Mercer, or Roger's students, anyway, recorded external dimensions of 25 by 35 meters. So very large and very eccentric. Not Roger, the data. Um, Ewan Mackay on the same site recorded 9.9 .9 meters by 7.2 meters as the internal radii. And a laser scan survey, which we did on the site uh, in 2017, actually shows that the site is almost perfectly circular and that its deviation from circularity is nowhere greater than plus or minus 10 millimetres. Now the eccentricities arise from the fact that if you measure along the plane, then the circle becomes, the circle of the surface becomes an ellipse. And if you're measuring in that plane consistently, the circuit of the foot of the wall also becomes elliptical. So when you see variant measurements, you're almost certainly looking at measurements not, a, not orthogonal, they're not horizontal measurements. You're looking at measurements that are affected by um, the, the disposition of the remains. The second source of error lies in uh, and, and the more easy, in, in the use, the common use 
of the measurement of the exter exterior of the brock to determine not only the external size, but by subtracting the thickness of the wall, the internal radius, which is fine, it seems logical, but the brock was set out at a level, and rationally you would assume that most of those levels are ground level. And that's the only place where the ratio between the internal ratio, uh, radius and the external ra radius is what was intended. At any other height, the external radius is smaller. Noel created the idea of, uh, Noel Foyot created the idea of the Brock Wall Index. You know, what percentage of the, uh, of, of the footing of the Brock is made up of wall. And his values come out in the high 40%. But the reality is that unless you know where the brock was measured, the measurements you're looking at are meaningless. And not only are they meaningless, they're all smaller than the original measurement. So the distribution of these measurements is not like the usual, um, what do you call that, Gaussian waveform. It's a Poisson waveform with 50% there. Okay. They have to come out smaller because of the geometry of, of the site we're looking at. So the measurements, the actual metrication of, uh, the actual metrics of these brocks, as they exist in the literature, are generally unreliable. And if you want to know what they measure, and if you want to know what their shapes are, it's, you just have to go out and measure them again. Um, that may mean using more sophisticated instruments. Um, and in reality, we're not going to get realistic measurements until we clear to the wall foot inside and out. Now, if we, if we say, as I do say, then I think that the, the real uh, wall foot proportion is 50%, then, oh, then we could imagine a geometric mode of setting out, a theoretical geometric mode of setting out, which is if you draw the incircle and the circumcircle of an equilateral triangle, um, the inner one is half the, the radius of the inner circle is half the radius of the outer circle. And perhaps, as in more sophisticated buildings, there was a, geomet a geometry underlying the conceptualization of what a brock might uh, be struck out at. But I think in that direction lies madness. <laughs> I, love, I love Dürer anyhow, but I love the way in which he builds in little numerical puzzles into his, um, into his work. This work is called Melancholia. I have often felt like that, struggling with brocks. <laughs> Right, economic forces and economic factors. Do I have anything else to say there? No. I'll go back there for a moment. 74, blah, blah, blah. Modern studies have not identified, uh, as I've said, gender differences in work capacity. And it's assumed here that women were actively and equally engaged in the construction project and probably that able-bodied children were equally engaged in it. Thus, pretty much the whole of the production-enabled group of the community could be involved in building a rock tower. But even if, it were, even, if it were, even if it were concluded within a single year, its drain on the domestic economy would have been very substantial. This is the opportunity cost to which we referred earlier. If you're not out plowing the fields or milking the cattle or whatever, and you're away doing something else, then you're not actually doing that, and that's a cost. But if you're on the site and you're being fed and watered to do your work, presumably by the commissioning agent, landlord, uh, local tyrant, whatever he might have been, um, then there's the additional cost of your energy inputs uh, that have to be borne there. We pay twice for everything, I guess is the point. If we adopt for a moment the farming republic model, you'll remember that this was uh, this is a reference to um, Alex Wolfe and James Fraser's work in the early medieval period based on social models that were generated initially uh, in Scandinavia. We can imagine that a prime farmer who was primus inter pares, uh, who has risen to local prominence, 
might wish to build a Brock in order to assure his right to have a, a shot at the crown. Um, and he would have had, or she would have had, control over the labour of the clients of the estate. Subservient additions of his or her family's labour pool might have been, uh, might have had leased to them uh, third party farms. And the status of the prime farmer would have been underpinned not only by his home farm, but by earnings from those serving uh, on tenanted farms. Building a brock would reverse the revenue stream because it must be supposed that the labour demands of the Brock would distract all but a skeleton staff from subsistence activities. And in addition, as we've said, the Buildings Commissioner had to provide, uh, presumably, nourishment for the labour force. This reversal of capital costs and of revenue um, earnings, I think, would have been sufficient to weaken the prime fact of farmers' tenure, especially in a febrile social landscape like a... Uh, like a farming republic, um, and uh, make it, uh, you know, give his rivals opportunities to displace him. In addition, we've also seen that the Brocks are very high maintenance structures. They fall apart early and often. Keep thinking of Northern Irish voting policies, early and often. Um, and they require significant interventions, even very early in their biographies. So the risks upon attendant on their construction might have increasingly discouraged their construction in the context not only of the financial risk of undertaking the work, but of the political risk attendant upon the financial commitment. For this, and for the reasons that we've observed and discussed or, or illustrated over the past five lectures, I have come to the conclusion that Brock building was a short duration practice. I can't imagine that generation after generation observing the hassle of financing these things and then the joy of watching them fall apart would wish to repeat the process. Sadly, this hypothesis which I put forward is a speculation because I, don't, I can't see how to test it. Um, given the imprecision of radiocarbon dating, and the difficulty of relating the Brock contents to their construction, um, refining the sequences of events and looking sensibly at the, at the chronological interrelationships of these monuments would be difficult. Um, and, and certainly at this kind of scale of resolution, impossible. Right, that prompts me to comment on the dating of the Brocks. Obviously, Unless the taphonomy of a deposit farming process of a dated deposit is understood, then the use of the date from that deposit can easily be misleading. With Brock related chronologies, and these have been helpfully set out by Simon Gilmore in his 2005 paper, Tables 1 to 7, the dates are derived from materials found in, on, and around the Brock monument and do not date its construction. Even in modern excavations like Scalloway or the unbottomed Dunvulan, um, as Dockrell uh, comments, uh, the, all of the dating evidence is derived from deposits contained within the Brock associated with occupational sequences rather than constructional sequences. I've argued above that uh, Old Scatness and Thrumster have produced, produced <coughs> suitable dating material and have yielded closely similar dates. Dating the container by its contents is clearly a high-risk strategy, but dating the container from its contents remains a common practice for all structural remains and, in my opinion, plagues equally the study of Neolithic burials and chambered megalithic tombs, where although we acknowledge that where we have suitable strategies of radiocarbon dates, the bodies may date to a range of over 1,500 up to 2,000 years uh, in, in their deposition. Nonetheless, some authorities, and I go back to John Hedges, have treated the deposition of human bone as equivalent to the construction date and as being culturally coherent and further as being indicative of a single Neolithic rite. Other writers found on best guesses based on the earliest date of something from inside the container rather than the container itself. 
The difficulty of dealing with chamber floor deposits in the Neolithic is acknowledged by Audrey Henshaw, who for I think most of us would be the Diane of Scottish Neolithic tool studies. Um, and she's emphasised the importance of circumspection in dealing with these internal chamber floor deposits, or CFDs, she says. It follows, having discussed them, she says, it follows that many conclusions based on this deeply unsatisfactory material should be abandoned or at very least re-examined. Regrettably, there isn't a corresponding scholarly expression uh, of reservation uh, with respect to the contents of Brock. I have argued that the Thrumster and Old Scatness dates should be indicative of the initiation of rock building in the 4th century BC, so as to allow time for the many structural modifications observable in that masonry before settlement deposits began to form. Similarly, at Clachtal, the Brock had experienced a major collapse and had been reformed before the settlement deposits accumulated within it in what was the cleared garth in the second century BC. I've suggested that the coarse gravelly deposits of hair found inside Duntrodden may, like the soil developed inside Thrumster, represent in situ development. And certainly at Thrumster, it closely followed the construction of the brock wall, which it abutted. However, neither deposit contained any anthropic material and neither informs us of the nature of the use of the primary brocks. Are you getting depressed looking at this? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> the grave yawns for us all. It is a Sunday. The spread of a canonical form of such idiosyncrasy as the brock over the whole of the territory in which we now find them suggests to me and remember, it's a consistent monument and it's all over that territory. It suggests to me that there was no cultural impediment to its gaining traction over the whole of that territory, from which I conclude that the whole territory was a single cultural entity at the time, and the Brock was as relevant in Shetland as it was in Argyll or the Outer Hebrides. Despite this, significant differences exist between the East and West Coast monuments in two specific respects. Firstly, the artifact assemblages from the East Coast sites are richer in total volume and in the number of artifact types and materials recovered than are the West Coast brocks. This is a generally agreed perception, and one which Ewan has highlighted long since. See, for example, his 2000 paper in John Henderson's BAR. And additionally, of course, on the East Coast, um, and by East Coast, I'm taking the whole of the East Coast and the Northern Isles, um, there are found many um, village-like settlements uh, where we have none uh, on the West Coast. These differences are su sufficient to suggest to me that a different cultural milieu persisted, or uh, let me put it the other way. It has been suggested that there are some sort of cultural differences between developments on the East Coast and on the West Coast, contemporary or contemporaneously with the construction of Bronx. But my argument is that this proliferation in artifactual delivery and the creation of the villages should be attributed to the period 200 BC to 200 AD which begins, therefore, 200 years after the brocks were built in the 4th century BC. Despite the widespread assumption that brock villages are contemporary with the brocks, <laughs> there's actually no evidence. I challenged you the other day, and maybe you're going to put me straight after this. I challenged you uh, to produce that evidence that suggests that the brock villages are contemporary with the brocks. I haven't seen that evidence. There is clearly a 2nd century BC resurgimiento on the east coast, including the Northern, Northern Isles, which can have been entirely homegrown. If the competition between farming dynasties within the farming republic that spawned the Brocks finally began to form larger region-wide polities, in the process their rulers would have acquired greater disposable wealth facilitating trade, facilitating trade with the south and encouraging the use of new artifacts, materials, forms and technologies. 
An initial period of respect for the Brocks might have encouraged their refurbishment and perhaps the construction of simulacra. The reused or simulated Brocks were now generally in truncated form and possibly served as citadels or some sort of administrative centres within these new villages. This is a form of self-spoliation in that the population involved culturally appropriated the monuments of its own past, in a way like banks using classical facades want to, want to portray their honesty. Uh, they'll have to start building bigger facades. Um, uh, in the West, we didn't have, because, and I think it's because the, air, the settlement areas in the West are more finely segmented and widely divided, and we did not have the population uh, volumes uh, to drive that regionalization, uh, and so they remained as brocks, benefiting from the East Coast acculturation only by the ex um, acquisition of fancy gigos, like it's a pottery. Re <laughs> returning briefly, to the topic of conversation and archaeologists' relationships to standing monuments. Um, I would add to our burdens in dealing with these standing monuments, not only that we need to conserve them, but that what, we, what it is that we need to conserve is the dynamics of their sequential development. Standard conservation theories like Burra already suggest that you can't pick and choose. You can't chop away the later accretions and pick the Bronze Age, for example, on a multi-period site just because you like the Bronze Age. Um, our obligation is to recover something of the whole of that canon. We've done it accidentally in the um, uh, creation of the chimera at Midhau and at Garnes, uh, but we need to do it more consciously in the future. And finally, and having avoided successfully, I think, most mention of artefacts, I would have proposed to you that on any site, the monument is the biggest artefact, and yet in most reports, it's the one that receives the least attention. We need to look at the monument. We need to, it's the only primary context on the site. It's the only original thing, guaranteed original thing on the site. And we need to treat it with more, more consciously and more analytically with the respect that it deserves. And now, you'll be delighted to know, I'm almost but not quite finished. I wanted to summarize or provide you with a meta narrative for what we've looked at. <coughs> Firstly, I, I propose to you, and I believe that I have shown you um, an evidential basis for the conclusion that chambered cairns are a vernacular form of architecture with local building traditions that retained relict features like skeuomorphic entrance passages and ignored some spandrels, which I didn't enlarge upon earlier, but like the antechambers. Antechambers are created to keep the ends of the tholos apart, but they create a very useful space for which no distinct social function can be identified in the excavated evidence. This implies, the fact that they are vernacular forms, imply that its form was not being driven by a very clear social design. Secondly, their regional differentiation and two or three orders of magnitude size range together point to stratified and relatively interconnected societies, not isolated, subs not isolated subsistence farming groups which is sort of the alternative that we're offered. Um, okay, leave that there. Um, thirdly, the bulk of their design changes relate to the management of a single structural challenge, which is the integration of the chamber and passage. And almost all of the significant variations are in that zone. 
But these are significantly, very significantly impacted upon by the lithologies in which they are built. And some of our monument types are distinguishable on the basis of the lithologies on which they are found, of which the very short cairns built in Howard Rock that we talked about earlier, the very short passages um, of those cairns are very distinctly related to um, the volcanic and metamorphic rock areas. <coughs> Finally, their structural attributes indicate social organizations that are more sophisticated than the woodland elf model um, or the particularized models that relegate their population to roles of inanimate agency. That would be my conclusion about the architecture of chambered cairns. And my conclusions on Brock's, and I wish they'd never happened. Um, the, that Brocks are formal, are a, uh, you know, unlike the Neolithic chambered cairns, the Brocks are a formal or so-called polite form of architecture, too fragile in their design and too demanding in their engineering to have been a purely vernacular tradition. Their built distribution covers the whole of the territory of their survival and their canonicity was preserved throughout that range. Structural canonicity of a complex structural form does not point to cultural diversity throughout the territory. Subsequently then, east of Dromalbin, or east of the spine of Scotland, uh, and between 200 BC and 200 AD, a cultural uplift, possibly based on the coalescence of numbers of farming republics that encouraged trade, village settlement forms, I beg your pardon, encouraged trade, encouraged building forms and deepened the social pyramid with consequent accumulation of wealth. And west of Dromalban, brocks continued to be used as brocks with some inputs from the east coast, not many, and still within farming republics. That's the summary. <laughs> um, I don't... Yes. Et missa est. Um, Thank you very much uh, uh, for listening. Thank you.